I hope you're all doing swell. I'm Jake, your friendly neighborhood Ashen Hollow. Oh, buddy, the painted world of Ariandel. Where do I begin? That is, in fact, a question that's troubled me for a couple of days now. This DLC brought a very deep amount of lore to the table, but with how deep it gets, it's equally vague, so there's quite a bit of dissecting to do, as well as making our own points. And, well, you guys know me best as the lore guy who sits in a smoky basement with my hair in a fritz connecting red strings to hundreds of pictures and newspaper clippings onto my wall to pull these seemingly crazy but still sensible theories out of my ass. And let me tell you, when I bought this DLC, I bought another 1200 yards of red string with it. So I think for this first video, I want to highlight the characters and main plotline in the DLC and bring up some points I found incredibly interesting, and then sort of tease a pretty juicy theory I'm working on for a future video but isn't quite ready yet. So let's jump into it. Also, you'd be surprised that within a painted world between people from Londor, there was no direct reference to Velka in this DLC, which actually shocked me quite a bit. There were a few instances that I think could be referencing her, so I will bring those up, and you know that the Ashen Hollow is just a moniker for my real name, which happens to be Velka Fanboy 69 so you can bet we're going to be tying Velka to some shit. Now I know not all of you have had a chance to play the DLC before this video, so for those of you that haven't, I will give a very brief outline on the main story before we get into the nitty gritty stuff. So we begin our journey into the painted world by touching a piece of the painting presented to us by Gale. In the painting, we meet a woman named Freda, who happens to be the eldest daughter of the Sable Church of Londor. Her knight Wilhelm, I think that's how it's pronounced, I don't know if they actually said it in game or not, either way you guys know I'm bad at words, and an unnamed painter. I'll also bring up an unnamed character who I think is technically a Corvian, but a seriously incomplete and or messed up version of one. So, in the painting world, the world has begun to rot, and fire is the way to reset the world. Kind of like a complete opposite of what's going on in the real world. But Freyda convinces Father Ariandel, the restorer of this painting, to reject the fire. So basically, she's like the Lord Gwyn of the painted world. So the painter cannot paint another world until she is shown fire. And the way to show her fire is by defeating Freyda and Ariandel so that the blood can no longer appease the flame. So that's the briefest outline of the main story, so let's get into the details. The first thing I want to highlight is a piece of dialogue we get when we very first encounter Gale before actually speaking to him ourselves. Merciful goddess, mother of the forlorn, who have no place to call their own. Please bear witness to our resolve. Fire for Ariandel. Fire for Ariandel. That's the biggest shout out to Velka I believe is in this DLC. What other goddess do we know that is the mother to the Forlorn? No one but Velka. So here we see Gale praying to her for fire for Ariandel. This painted world has gone on much longer than it was intended to, thanks to Freyda and Ariandel. If we read the soul of sister Freyda, it says, Freyda was the first Ash to enter the painting, but together with the good father, they chose rot over fire. Choosing rot over fire is quite heretical in terms of the norm for the painted world. So while many of the denizens of the painted world flock behind Freyda, many of them also wish to see their world burn. There is an interesting piece of dialogue from our weirdly Corvian friend after we show the painter fire. When the world rots, we set it afire for the sake of the next world. It's the one thing we do right, unlike those fools on the outside. It's the one thing they do right, unlike the fools in the outside world. We know setting the world on its natural course and bringing in the Age of Dark has kind of been the theme behind Velka, at least if you believe my theories about her. 
We know she had a huge role in the painted world of Ariamis, and we know that whether directly or indirectly, she is a significant driving force behind the Sable Church. Here is something else interesting. In the painted world of Arian Zell, we see a statue of a child with presumably her mother, but the mother figure has had its head removed. Now take note of this statue's posture and hand positions. Now here is the statue of Velka in the painted world of Ariamis, basically looking exactly the same as the beheaded mother statue. That and both of these statues are turned by levers in some sort of basement, which open the door to the boss of the DLC area. So I believe it very likely that Velka is behind this painted world and the painted world in general, which we now have to assume there's been multiple painted worlds and they just keep getting reset when the time is right. But now we have Freyda who has put a hole on the flame and is letting the rot spread. The description for the ordained set she is wearing says, Garb of Freyda, sister of the painted world, a light blue dress sewn with thin fabric. After renouncing everything, Freyda discovered a people that she wished to protect and assumed the precise form that they yearned for. So here we confirm that renouncing everything meant that she has forsook the very teaching of the church she was part of creating. And just to confirm it even further, here is a new bit of dialogue from her sister Yuria if we talk to her while in possession of Freyda's soul. Ah, our lord and liege, t'was the soul of my sister, Elfrida, a poor wench turned to ash who would abandon Londor. If thou wouldst, let it nourish thy lordship, and in return do her once more kindness. Remember those who stayed by her to the end? in the shadows cast by fire. So what I also find interesting is that it says Freyda assumed the precise form that they yearned for, they referencing to the forlorn souls inside the painted world. So now I don't even believe that Freyda actually looks like how we see her. So what form is it that she took? Did she take Velka's form, the mother of the forlorn herself? We know Velka has been MIA for some time. Hell, we've never even seen the woman ourselves. Which, how can I declare my undying love for her if she won't even reveal her damn self to me? So, perhaps the Forlorn were yearning for Velka, their mother, and settled for Freyda's form of her and her mother-like attitude towards them. The only physical attributes we really know about Velka is her black hair, which we see Freyda have, and her human size. But like I said, the DLC doesn't really give us a whole lot of straight-up information, so there's a lot of putting the pieces together ourselves here. But that's the most fun to me anyways. So we know Freyda is Ash, which is super interesting itself. As far as we know, Ash or Unkindled, whichever you prefer, are those who failed to link the flame. Now with this revelation, it has kind of sparked some new interest in the Ashen ones for me, as well as more information. I'm not sure that becoming Ash only means that you failed to link the flame, what if it could also mean you failed to usurp the flame? which we know the Sable Church is trying, and even in Dark Souls 1, Koth mentions that there have been several Dark Lords that have tried and failed to do so. So what if failing at that is enough to make someone Ash? I don't have all the answers to that yet, but a video I plan to do soon is going to be specifically about what it means to be an Ashen one, how they came to be, and who they really are. So there's that to look forward to, right? Now let's talk a little bit about Father Arian Zell. He and Freyda have chosen to let rot take its course instead of fire. Let's read the Rose of Arianzel. A flail used by the bulbous father of the painted world to shred his own skin, producing blood to appease the flame. Both a weapon and a miracle catalyst. Arianzel, being the restorer of the painted world, knew that it was painted with blood and only blood could protect the secret. That is definitely interesting to learn that the painting is painted with blood. Also, that Arian Dell is the restorer of the painted world. I'm curious as to what the difference between restoring the painted world and actually painting the painted world is. That's something I hope to crack soon, but it seems likely that with each passing painted world, there seems to be an appointed father, if you will, to watch over and perhaps to help the flame when the time is right. 
In this world, we know that role obviously falls to Arian Dell, but maybe in the last painting that we know of, this role was given to Ariamis. Now my favorite character introduced in this DLC is the painter, so let's talk about her now. We first find her locked away in a, I don't want to call it an attic per se, perhaps just the second story level, but we won't worry too much about painted world architecture at the moment. I think it's obvious she's locked away by Freyda, a big hint being Wilhelm has the key and is very hostile right below. And the painter herself says, I believe I feel the scent of ash upon thee. Thou art the one of whom Uncle Gale spoke, the one to show me flame. Tis good. When this is done, may I return. The door is open thanks to thee. Tis good. I'll head off to paint. I promised Uncle Gale I would. So she cannot paint a new world until she is shown flame. Coincidentally, she also can't without a friggin' canvas, all of which can't happen if she's hidden away, so well played Freyda. Something I strongly believe is that this painter is quite likely the daughter of Priscilla. And no, it's not just because of the white hair, let me explain. First, let's listen to what she says when aspiring her painting. I wish to paint a picture of a cold, dark, and very gentle place. One day, it will make someone a goodly home. That's why I must see flame. That's very specific. We know the painted world is a cold and dark place, no doubt. And it's like Priscilla said herself when we first encounter her in the painted world of Ariamis, this land is peaceful, its inhabitants kind. That correlates with being a very gentle place. It seems she aspires to paint a world just like the one Priscilla dwelled in. Perhaps this painter's kind and gentleness herself was passed from mother to daughter. There's also this. First, notice the eyes. Now while a different color, they're the exact type of eyes that Priscilla has as well. Then the scales. The only humanoids we know to have scales are the half-breeds we know, Priscilla, Yorshka, and now this painter. It looks kind of like the scales are spreading on her, sort of like an infection or something. I first thought that perhaps it's the rot, but considering her eyes and the fact that it looks like scales and is patterned like scales, well it just wouldn't make any sense for it not to be scales. But still, it appears like they are being spread through her body. Even up her arms we can see it. I'm not sure exactly what this all means, and she does not have a tail by the way. I did zoom up her skirt to check. I'm not perverted, I just needed to know. Well, I think I know what it could mean maybe, which leads me to the reveal of a quite difficult and large theory I'm working on building a case for that will get its very own video in the future, and that's that maybe primordial serpents are behind this whole thing. Perhaps the sisters of the Sable Church are serpents themselves. Serpents or snakes are just imperfect creatures that didn't become dragons, so they would still carry a lot of genes that the dragons would. So maybe Priscilla's father isn't Seath, the easiest choice. Londor loves to conceal their true selves and encourages Hollows to do the same per their untrue rings. We also know Freyda has taken a form, and let me also point out that she's the only NPC to share an eye color with Koth, and we know the sisters of the church to be very close to Koth. There is also this statue behind Ariandel as well, bottom half serpent, top half man. And don't forget the statues in Lothric that are quite the opposite, bottom half man, top half serpent. So perhaps they are able to take on human forms. But I'm just chipping away at this theory, now don't take my word for it just yet, it is still something I have to put a lot of time and thought into, I just thought it would be interesting to tease at for you all. Now, on to the most interesting thing the painter has to say. I can almost see the flame. Soon, Uncle Gale will bring me the pigment. I wonder if he has found it. The dark soul of man. What? She just dropped a pretty big bomb. She is painting the next painting with the dark soul of man. 
Wow. So now, at this point, I'm thinking, what the frick else can they do with the next DLC if not follow this up? Especially considering one of my own theories that Velka, aka the Witch of Izalith, is the Furt of Pygmy. Oh no, yeah, I went there, did two videos on it, and I feel like it's pretty convincing. It literally consumed me for an entire month. Feel free to click on the left or right side of the screen now to go to either of these videos. I recommend watching the one on the left first, since it is, well, the first part, but you don't have to. The one on the right just goes into wicked deep detail. Anyways, assuming you had heard that theory of mine, I found it interesting that in this painted world, we can be invaded by a livid pyromancer named Dunnel. What's more is that he is using Chaos Pyromancies, another Chaos Pyromancer in a painted world, wink wink. But now on top of that, he wields the Chaos Blade itself, the sword born from Quelag's soul. Plus, the new pyromancy we get right before fighting him and the one he showcases, Floating Chaos, reads, Pyromancer Dunnell was fascinated by the ceremonial art employed by the clerics of the Smoldering Lake. Chaos burns away in the blink of an eye, but was the primordial life born in the bed of Chaos and a grievous symbol of Izalith's sin. Which is interesting given that I argue that the first sin wasn't Gwen linking the fire, but rather the witch's attempt to recreate it. We don't ever see anything reverencing that Gwen had sinned, but here it is, plain and simple, that Velka did. Now to start wrapping things up, I just want to delve into some curiosities I found while exploring the DLC, and things I hope may spark into bigger theories in the future. So let's consider the Sisters of the Sable Church. We know they are all very capable swordsmen, so much in fact that they were able to found the Sable Church with just the three of them. The only one of the swords they used that we know of for sure is Yuria's Dark Drift. But what if another one of the blades is Black Blade? Off the bat, let me just mention how fitting both of the names of these swords are to Londor. Dark, Black, sword names that Edgar Allan Poe would be proud of. The description of Black Blade says, a short katana wielded by the swordsman and distinguished guest of High Lord Wolnir. This shiny black blade is thick but shorter than the typical katana. The swordman was a master of a rare technique, traces of which can be observed in this weapon's strong attack. So what's interesting about this is the swordman was a distinguished guest of Wolnir. Born from Wolnir's soul is the Black Serpent Pyromancy which, in the final phase of fighting Freyda, when she goes all humanity berserk, which by the way is awesome that she'd have that much of the Dark Soul, especially considering her kin to be the progenitor of the Dark Soul, Velka. Anyways, with her scythe, she casts the Black Serpent Pyromancy. Which, if Freyda could have been the guest of Wolnir, he could have taught her. That, and back in correlation with Dark and Chaos being very closely related, the Black Blade says that the Swordsman was a master of a rare technique which we can observe in its strong attack, which is the exact same strong attack as the original Chaos Blade in Dark Souls 1, which is cool, again, if we're considering that Dark and Chaos are related and that all the main faces associated with each are related as well. So a potential daughter of Velka could have had the blade that was born from another one of her daughter's souls. Plus, we see Freyda assume this stance with her scythe, which the player is unable to assume using the same weapon. That seems to be very similar to the Black and Chaos Blade's unique attack. Well, I believe that about covers it for now. Don't worry, I definitely plan to cover the other story arcs in this DLC. I'm particularly interested in the Champion's Grave Tender and the Grave Tender Great Wolf, but I mostly wanted to talk about the main DLC story arc in this video. I'm also very interested in the Pontiff Sullivan revelations we get in this DLC, in the fact that the Profaned Greatsword says that the Pontiff found the Profaned Flame in a tundra deep under Irithyll, which could maybe be in reference to this painted world. So, many videos are planned for the near future, including a player-made PvP covenant I'm working on. I can't give you too much to go on yet, but since I am Velka Fanboy 69 the covenant will be called The Sin Bros. So a lot of stuff I'm super excited to start jumping into, and I hope you guys are looking forward to them as well. Thanks for watching everyone, I'll catch you next time.